When Cecil Rhodes became Prime Minister of the Cape Colony in 1890, his dream was to build a railway from the Cape to Cairo, running like a British vein through the African veldt. It's a truly heroic notion, if for some slightly dubious reasons, but there's one thing for sure, it couldn't have happened without steam. There is a certain sort of Scotsman, and I naturally am not one of them, who, after a couple of drinks, will claim that James Watt invented the steam engine. And you're doing pretty well if you can get away with it. However, Watt's engine was not designed to move. If you're talking about locomotives, locomotion, you're talking about Trevithick and then Stevenson, of course. The layout is very, very basic, but it works beautifully, and it never really changed, except they just got a teensy-weensy bit larger. This is what you can do with a triple expansion engine. You can drag these monsters all the way from Manchester, where they were built, to open up a continent. I bet old Stevenson didn't imagine that happening. This is a Bower Peacock Garrett, it's a very rare and beautiful engine. You'll notice something's gone apparently horribly wrong with the layout of the wheels. This is a 464 464. The reason for this is the traction it gives you. It gives you a fantastic pulling power. And also, the two big bogies are articulated, so it can go around windy little tracks, of which there are many in Africa. These big British beasts are still in daily use, here at the amusingly named Wanky Colliery, along with several other old British locals shunting thousands of tons of coal up and down the horseshoe curb from the mine to the local plant. But despite their Jurassic appearance, they're actually not all that old. Funny to look at things like this and realize I used to go to school with trains like this, and yet now it seems like something out of a completely different era. It looks like a dinosaur, really. I mean, a very attractive dinosaur, of course. The kind of dinosaur you'd like to take to dinner and buy an expensive frock and hope that someday after a week or two it would gaze at you that wonderful, please, I love you, take me way, or, or am I talking about something else? No, it's a train, it's definitely, well, it's not a train, it's a locomotive. You must never, ever call it a train. Guys in Anorak will beat you to death on the spot. There is complete logic to these engines surviving out here. Firstly, there's no shortage of coal in Zimbabwe. Secondly, they build all their own spare parts, so no waiting for the second post to bring that vital piston from Germany. And thirdly, in a country this size, no one is that concerned about a bit of black smoke. Beautiful. Although it looks complicated, the steam locomotive is essentially quite simple. It's exactly the same layout as the tiny single-cylinder boat. Fire, boiler, steam, piston. Only the boiler had to be long and thin, otherwise you wouldn't get through the tunnels. And driving it is fairly straightforward. The really important things are your water level. If that gets very low, you're really deep to do. Your, your pressure, the state of your fire. There's the brake over there. And this is the, the regulator. The regulator is just a huge valve that lets the steam into the piston. Steamies to the left of them, steamies to the right of them. 
Oh, what a time they had. Despite the fact that these engines are in daily use, their numbers have dwindled since the heyday of the Empire. The steam sheds at Bulawayo used to service hundreds of locos, but now it's dropped to around a dozen. The main problem is keeping these beasts going. Since no one manufactures them anymore, new parts are hard to come by, which makes maintenance a highly regular task. This is how you reinsert a piston in a steam engine. All pretty straightforward, if you happen to be built by Elspeth McNulty. In the hole. There you go. Yeah. Right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll be right here. <laughs> Into this bag here. Yeah, it's always that. It's always the one nearest. There's no bloody room in it, is there? <laughs> always the one. You never use. You never use sockets in these, I suppose, do you? You're lucky my mother's not here. She'd be sprinting down the workshop. <laughs> <laughs> my God, they're back, she'd be screaming. <laughs> it was delightfully straightforward putting the loco back together again, like some huge Meccano set. But for these engineers, it's nothing special. There are guys here who've worked on trains all their lives and never sully their hands on a diesel. I declare this piston rod connected. <laughs> <laughs> Way in business, okay? But while all this Mancunian metal was all well and good, there was something sorely missing. Many of the engines that once worked in Zimbabwe came from Glasgow, and yet there'd be precious little sign of anything Scottish. I needn't have worried. Engine number 190 was built by the North British Company in the Queen's Park Works in Glasgow. She was one of a consignment of 20 engines ordered by the Rhodesian Railways Company to work the mainline service between Bulawayo and the Victoria Falls. And she arrived somewhat majestically in Africa on a triple expansion engine steamer in April 1926. The reason the steam locomotive never developed in quite the same technical way as the ship's engine was that there was really no need. Once you're on dry land, your problems evaporate. You simply build your watering and coaling stations as and when you need them, and employ some of the local talent to do the work. We're just about ready to go. So, with full tanks and bunkers, and a good head of steam in the boiler, we were off for one of the enduring landmarks of the Empire, the Victoria Falls Bridge. Engine 190 has a good few miles under her wheels, and things aren't quite as reliable as they used to be. With less than 50 miles to go to the falls, the engineers noticed that one of the axle boxes was running hot. On any other service, they'd simply arrange for a bus transfer, but here, they get on with a job. What they needed to do was to raise the middle axle, knock in some steel wedges, and ease the weight off the bearing. But how? You don't want to know. Putting sand down to make sure it doesn't slip as it goes. You could live a hundred years and not see a running repair like this. 
I wasn't sure whether we were privileged or in mortal danger. But we were back in business and heading full steam ahead for the falls. It's a bittersweet moment, this great lump of Scottish metal on an English bridge over a waterfall named after a British monarch in the middle of someone else's country. But whatever the politics, you don't need to be embarrassed by the engineering. Being here doesn't half make you appreciate the ingenuity of the mechanical mind. Set it a task and soon enough it comes up with a solution. The fact that the steam engine still runs in these parts proves what an enduring idea it was. It is a testament to an age when things were built to last, an idea as sensible as it is romantic. It's like a woman, really. You've got to look after them all the time. If you want to keep the pressure going in the relationship, they've got to be tended to every five minutes. In fact, if this engine was a lady, I'd marry it. I'm not really Jeremy Clarkson. I was just pretending.